Hope you guys are enjoying this little series on the 10 meter double sideband Novice 10 transceiver. In this section I'm going to go over the receiver. You might recognize this receiver as a direct conversion type. And uh, I'm not an expert on direct conversion receivers. I'm learning right along with you guys. But I am experiencing almost all of the problems that these receivers have and uh, they have a reputation that is well earned. There's even some folks that avoid using direct conversion style receivers because of some of these problems I'm going to bring up. Uh, one of them is that uh, all of your gain in a direct conversion receiver, uh, sometimes called a zero IF receiver or a homodyne. Homodyne meaning you're actually using the same frequency as your local oscillator and you're mixing to produce the audio demodulated output. Now with these style of receivers all of your gain is typically on the other side of the demodulator or the mixer. That means you could have upwards of 100 dB of audio gain, a very sensitive audio amplifier. Those of you that are used to using audio amplifiers uh, know that sometimes these amplifiers like to pick up extraneous signals. Uh, guitar amplifiers and hi-fis really like strong broadcast stations, strong ham radio stations, and CB signals. Uh, and uh, they'll demodulate them nicely and you hear them coming through the speaker. Well, that's what it's like with a direct conversion receiver. Same thing. A lot of audio gain means the de demodulation of extraneous AM signals that come in very strong. It's a simple thing for the thing to uh, be affected by signals like that. We generally don't like to put a lot of gain before the demodulator. So using uh, Gilbert cell type mixers such as the you know the 602 style mixer, the, uh, the 3028 differential amplifier, 1496 type Gilbert cell these types of demodulators typically have 20 to 30 dB of gain associated with them. So by their nature, they're very susceptible to picking up strong in-band or close-to-band type signals. So you might be uh, on 40 meters and you're picking up strong broadcast shortwave stations that are in the band. And you're wondering, how can I get rid of that? Now, a second problem with the direct conversion or the homodyne is a hum pickup. Ground loops of any kind uh, find themselves on the input of that very sensitive amplifier and they come sailing through. We're really not interested in zero IF. We, we don't care about signals that we demodulate between zero and 300 Hertz for instance. We're interested in the voice band of 300 to 3000 Hertz. So one way to fight that problem beyond just getting rid of as many ground loops as you can in your circuit, proper grounding, is to actually filter, and this is high pass filtering now, everything below 300 Hertz. So in a very sophisticated direct conversion receiver, you would see some pretty strict audio band pass filtering between 300 and 3000 Hertz. Now we don't have that here, but we have some features that can uh, lead to improved voice quality and getting rid of some of that hum. I will have a demonstration showing uh, some of this ground loop activity associated with leads coming in such as the power leads or the microphone and anything you attach to this uh, can open it up to uh, the ground uh, loop problem. So with the traditional direct conversion receiver we end up not putting a lot of gain in front of the mixer or demodulator. And uh, that's because we're operating on 80 meters and 40 meters. They're very, very susceptible to broadcast and shortwave broadcast type interference. So we try to keep a very strong mixer or, or demodulator. Usually it's a, a, a double balanced mixer type or a single balanced mixer diode type like we're using. Rather than using the Gilbert cells uh, for the serious designs. Now up here on 10 meters we have another problem. It's called the CB band. And that CB band needs to be knocked down because it'll come in and again the AM will be easily demodulated. I knew I needed more gain up on 10 meters. So the way that I solved that 
was by adding selectivity and RF gain control at the front end. So by having uh, about 20 dB of gain before the mixer, I'm able to establish enough noise figure that I can start to compete with your radio, you know, your professional ham radio. This thing has similar sensitivity because I have an RF amplifier ahead of that strong mixer. But the penalty is we have to be really careful with that amplifier not to encourage some of those out-of-band strong interferers to break through and cause uh, problems with the with the audio. But breaking up some of that gain, so let's say we have 20 dB ahead of the mixer, that's 20 dB we don't need in the audio chain and things start to behave a little more normally. So I do have quite a bit of audio gain but I also have some RF gain and that makes up for the losses of the mixer. So uh, let's get into uh, the receiver. Let's uh, fight the problems one at a time. Let's get started with part five of the Novice 10 double side band transceiver Doctor, project. I'm running probably 20 some watts, but the trouble is I'm driving an amp. <laughs> anyway, 73, all the best, and uh, yeah, you, you got a good signal. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, KC3 TLO in uh, Maryland, K5 Bravo Mike, 73, all the best. Okay, Germany 1, Papa Uniform Uniform, K5, uh, Bravo Mike. Good signal. I didn't uh, check the S meter, but, uh, yeah, you're coming through quite well here into Oklahoma. Operators Tom, a Tango Oscar Mike. Uh, go ahead. Roger, roger, Tom. Nice to uh, me on the 10-meter band. Operator name here is Steve, and uh, you're 59 plus 10 into the UK. So I had a question uh, from one of the subscribers that uh, why aren't you using these power pole adapter, power pole connectors rather than real connectors? And the, the answer is I didn't know about them. Um, I've seen something like this for drones, but I didn't know that these were an actual thing. So I will order a kit of those and uh, show you how we can use those things in our projects looks like they're a sexless connector that go together only one direction they're color-coded what's not to love right and inexpensive uh, another issue um, reverse polarity protection it's a big deal with uh, solid-state equipment hooking things up in reverse is pretty sure to blow something up of course we could do a p-channel MOSFET that would turn on fully and have almost no drop. But uh, again, I go back to the ATX power supply. Those power supplies that are found discarded for PCs have a lot of interesting parts you can reuse. One of them is this dual shock key diode that typically is the main rectifier. Uh, these have really low drop and there's two of them in each of these packages. But this, uh, this Shockey, I mean, right out of the box, you're at 0.159, and there are two of them, so you would use them both in parallel. So even at the 1 amp level, I would expect that you could easily be under 0.2 volts drop uh, with that device. So there's a freebie way of getting reverse polarity protection. Okay, let's take a look at some of the features. We have the, uh, the power inlet. Okay, and that's going to come in through the reverse polarity protection. You come in, go through the fuse, right to the polarity protection. From the polarity protection, it goes through a ferrite bead over to the power conditioning uh, filtering, which is two capacitors, a 47 mic and a 0.1. Your power switch should be somewhere in line with this group. Typically, I like to put that before the fuse. After power conditioning, it goes to a relay. The relay has the power saver circuit down here. So this is definitely one of those uh, who cares type circuits, unless you really need it. We've got our double pull, double throw relay. Half of the relay is being used as our RF switch. 
and half of the relay is going to be our transmit and receive voltage switch. Once you're up around 12 or 13 volts, it draws 15 milliamps. Okay, let's measure the coil. See how many ohms it is. Okay, just a little over 700 ohms for the coil. So I'm going to make a keep alive circuit. It's kind of a current saving circuit consisting of an RC that we basically put in series with the relay. You see, it's this little RC that we have, and uh, that goes up to the voltage at the top of the relay. Of course, we have our uh, reverse spike protection diode there. But the PTT is going to ground the bottom of the coil, and the relay will actuate. If I size the RC properly, I should be able to save some of that current. So instead of drawing the full 15 milliamps, I might be able to cut that current down. And the way that happens is the capacitor looks like an instantaneous short circuit. So you get the full voltage applied. But once the capacitor charges up, now the resistor comes in line and it saves some current. First, let's put the full voltage right across the, the coil without the RC circuit in line. And we can see that it's drawing 15 milliamps, and this is at 13 volts DC. Now I have put a 2K resistor and a 100 microfarad 25 volt capacitor in the RC spot. So let's see if it actuates the relay. It did. And notice now the capacitor is charging. And our holding current is around 6 milliamps. So we've saved more than half the current to hold the relay. So with 6 milliamps, that's still enough to keep the relay closed, but of course that would not be enough to actuate the relay. Power lead here, which is the one that services the power amplifier. That's where most of the current's going to go. A smaller lead for the receive, uh, the receive type voltage for the receive circuits, and one for the transmit circuits. On the other side, we have the other part of the relay. This part of the relay services the RF uh, connections, the receiver input, the transmitter output, and the antenna connector. So they're all right next to the connector. This may be a little bit overkill for what you were thinking, but it gets the RF switching very close to the connector where you want it. Uh, good grounding, good power protection, and filtering right up front before we even get to our little boards that we're going to be powering. Let's take a look at some of the schematic progress. Here is the power entry and conditioning and switching section. Power enters through two ferrite beads. Uh, this could be improved for a direct conversion receiver by making it a common mode choke. You could do this with a type 43, 75, or 77 binocular core, or even with a toroid with both the positive and negative wires looping through three or four times. Then we have the reverse polarity protection diode and a fuse. I've got a 1 amp in there, but you could probably use a, a 2 amp or a 3 amp fast blow fuse. Uh, then there's a couple of capacitors for more noise filtering. Hey, maybe you go mobile and you want to use it with a cigar uh, outlet in your car. Some circuits require continuous power, like the VXO and the power amp final. You don't want to run them through the relay. You want them to have 12 volts at all time. But you do want to cut off the power amplifier so it's not drawing current. And we do that by changing the base bias in receive. The relay switches both the antenna and it provides that RX and TX 12 volt power that we're switching. The Relay Power Saver RC network can be adapted to almost any 12 volt relay. The red and the green LEDs for transmit and receive, they almost always require different dropping resistors to achieve the same relative illumination. As I said earlier in uh, some of the other videos, these are preliminary schematics. You know, those circuits that you find in the textbook, online, in blogs, and even expertly engineered and modeled circuits are only deemed good 
when they're actually tested and proven circuits and that takes time. There's almost always surprises when you build something. The mic amp was tested. That's a tried and true circuit and I'm happy with it. I stated before I wanted the receiver to have the benefit of an RF low pass filter so that meant that the filter, the output filter, had to be in between the antenna connector and the common terminal on that relay. The RF preamplifier on this second build, I've actually built the receiver twice now, was not as well laid out as on my first one, and did I ever pay a price for that? It revealed that the common base preamp can readily oscillate if not enough isolation exists in the layout. So the resistor, which was formerly a no populate across that collector tune circuit, I had to put in a 2.7K to calm it down. So be prepared to put anything from a 1K to a 10K in that uh, spot across that tuned circuit. The gain control can really be anything from probably two or 300 ohms up to a 1K potentiometer. But be sure to use miniature coax in and out of that pot. The single balance demodulator is almost identical to the modulator circuit, but I did leave off the 100 or 200 ohm balancing pot the detector actually would benefit from having that pot included, but I didn't think it was necessary as long as I had the diodes fairly well matched. But remember, balance is always beneficial, even on receive. The post-detection termination diplexer and filtering system, it's adequate, but there's another place where we could make great improvements and sharpen the audio response just for speech frequencies. So I got a big surprise when I went from transmit to receive the first time, back to transmit. The LM386 made a mooing sound and there was a big pop. So I had to figure out what was going on. Well, it turned out that that 1000 microfarad capacitor across the 386 was taking a long time to discharge on receive. So I ended up putting a diode in place of the resistor I had feeding that capacitor. That means that uh, with a muting circuit that the large capacitor wouldn't influence the rest of the circuit and I could cut the 386 off uh, by cleverly shorting out the junction of the feed resistors on the input differential amp. Basically it takes the voltage at diff amp to ground killing power and muting the 386 fairly well. But of course this costs another 2N2222. Here's an update on the final schematic, again a work in progress. As you can see the Super VXO has evolved some. I'm now getting upwards of 30 kilohertz of delta frequency, which is a big improvement over the 10 or 12 kilohertz I had originally. This could probably be improved further by adding a third crystal or by using a real Varactor diode in place of the 4001. But again, the two crystals and the 1N4001 seem to give me adequate range for what we're doing with this simple transceiver. Okay, some of you might think it's impossible to cut out an, a dip type pattern using a Dremel tool, but with a small bit you can actually do the job. You can get in there and you can uh, make some, some vertical lines in between the pins, then you slice across and you can form the pads. I put a socket in here so I could pop in some different LM386 chips. Also, uh, over here, this is the mic preamp. Already gone over that. Now I'm starting to build the receiver on this board. And with any receiver, you always start with the end first. In other words, you start with the speaker or the earphone part, get the power amp working, then you move back to the preamp, then you move back to the demodulator, and then finally to the input amplifier. You always work backwards when you're designing or building a receiver. That means you can test each stage in steps. Ah, I'm getting hum out of the amplifier. It's working. Oh, I can put a signal in the preamplifier. It's working. Now I can go to the demodulator and so on. So you always build backwards with receivers and of course forward with transmitters. <laughs> Roger, Roger, Uniform Alpha 3, Zulu Delta Charlie. The, the name here is Will, Whiskey India Lima Lima. I'm located in Central Texas. 
I'm that insured. Holy cow. See you later. You had, uh, and they have a uh, good afternoon uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, seven three and six game. sugar papa papa audio game. So let me talk just a little bit about the construction technique. I have not got the transmitter components installed, but I do have the filter in line with the antenna, and that's before the switch. Right now it's in the receive mode. The green LED is illuminated in receive. One trick is to actually lift the boards off the deck by about a sixteenth of an inch using spacers. This allows you to put wiring underneath the boards which gets the wires out of the way. And this is really important as you continue to improve the circuit and work on the top of the boards. It's worth doing that little bit of extra work running those wires underneath the board. Now they're going to have a ground plane above and a ground plane formed by the chassis below and that helps with crosstalk and all kinds of other feedback issues and improves isolation in general. So having all those wires underneath the circuit card is uh, my recommendation. So let me uh, point out a few of the... You know, it's been just about right. We've been too dry recently. Let me point out some of the uh, circuitry here. This is the VXO over here going through the amplifier and that into the splitter. Half of it, of course, is going to be feeding the demodulator mixer over here, and the other half is going to go out to the final amplifier board, which I don't have installed right now. I'm still building that in a shape that will fit in here properly. I did move most of the output filter components on the front side of the switch. So they live right up here by the antenna connector. So this is the power that's going to go to the power amplifier, this wire right here, and this is the switched power that's going to go to the switched TX circuits in the power amp board. So they're just kind of hanging in midair. I was able to use the, the on-off volume uh, control, and this is the RF gain control here. These are both miniature components, so they fit in here really nicely. Uh, the green LED is on when we have received power. This is a modern LED that takes almost no current to light up. Um, the VXO now tunes about 30 kilohertz, which is an improvement over what I had, and I got that by adding this inductor to the two crystals that are paralleled up. So this is the Super VXO circuit using the, the Series L addition. So you're never happy with something like this. You always want more frequency ability, but it is what it is, and without having a... Uh, either a synthesizer, a direct digital, or a phase-lock loop synthesizer, or a very good VFO, you're kind of stuck with this or having a whole bunch of different crystals that you switch into your VXO. Now this is miniature. I definitely am pushing the envelope with miniaturization, and uh, this shows that having separate little boards makes it easier to package. I think you all agree that uh, being able to put the switchboard near the connector having the uh, separate VXO and separate receiver boards. Now this gives me more flexibility with the power amp over here. If that was all on one board, I think what I would like to do is have a system where I could score all of those and snap them off so that I could repackage it any way I want, or I could just leave it as one board and put it in a, a thin, wider type uh, case. But I'd like the ability to have both best of both worlds, separate little boards or one big circuit board. Okay, can you guys hear that hum? I've got the gain up full blast. Now when I put my hands on the metal, hear how the hum changes? That is the dreaded direct conversion hum. Okay? Now watch what happens when I put a bead on there. Now I'm feeding this, of course, from an analog power supply. But there's a possibility of a ground loop here. So let's put this ferrite bead in there. It's hard to get this uh, test prod wire to uh, behave normally. Okay, power supply back on. 
Okay, you can see I've got the bead in line now. No more hum. Okay, the bead in the power supply line got rid of that common mode hum. I'm going to carefully remove the bead. Hope you can see that the bead did calm down a lot of the common mode hum. So another issue with the uh, LM386, especially when you just kill power, sometimes it does silly stuff. So let's PTT. That's really not something that we want. So here's a use for pin 7 on the LM386. That's a place where you can bypass the uh, input stage differential amplifiers power supply in between two 15K resistors. If you have a good clean supply, you usually don't need to use that pin, but you can put a uh, capacitor on that pin and it improves the uh, power supply rejection and can improve noise if you have a noisy power supply. But in this case, I'm going to strap a 2N2222 between pin 7 and ground. And uh, this is going to be interesting because it's going to pull pin 7 to ground, and of course that's going to cut off that input stage immediately. Let's see if this will mute the 3, uh, 386. Ocean Hotel, six radio mic. Calling Delta. That's a little bit better, huh? Ocean radio mic. This little gem that I picked up today at a flea market, it's a CB, um, a Bristol CB, looks like a 40 channel. Fairly late model, and uh, what kind of parts can we get out of uh, an old CB? And look, it's marked $5. I paid five dollars for this CB. Let's see what I can well, get out. First of all, I got this nice microphone. So if this is wired the same way as the other one, this should work fine for the double sideband rig. So uh, dynamic microphone, that's worth five dollars. So let's just consider the basic goodies that I've pulled off the CB that might be useful in our double sideband project. First of all, the final transistor is a 2SC678. That is a known CB final. That would work perfectly. In the final RF amplifier spot. And it looks like we have a nice driver transistor. It's a 2SC495. Again, a known driver transistor. 4-pin mic connector that will work with that dynamic mic. That's exactly what I am using in the project. And look, here's your on volume control, and it's the exact right control, 10K with an audio taper. That's perfect. There were a couple of uh, jacks, and there's other things. How about this 1-watt speaker? So, right out of the uh, box, just these few items have saved me a lot of money and a lot of time. There's still a lot of parts on this carcass. Now we'll call it a carcass. I looked at the transistors. It's got a bunch of 2SC 945s. It's got dual gate MOSFETs in it. It's got these audio transformers, all useful items. But these are the basic items that I think we would use in our project. The 23 channels and the 20 and the 40 channels have useful parts for this project.